The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on the Russ Belleville Show are their own, and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. And it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Brought to you by the National Cannabis Coalition. Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. We love it. Oh, yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Good day. I'm so glad we're back. It is Tuesday, August 28th. 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the in the world. Sorry about missing you yesterday. Our internet was down here at Rolla J Studios, so uh, we've got it back up and running, and we got more shows to, for you this week. Thanks for being here. Uh, running again on Skeleton Crew here at Rolla J Studios, but joining us here at the engineer desk, we do have Brian the Red, who is holding down the fort. How you doing, Brian? Holding down, Russ. Seems, we gotta do. Seems a little lonely here this week. You know, Big Daddy Fink was here in the studio uh, all week, and now he's gone. He's gone back to Georgia, where he is suffering voodoo donut withdrawals. Yeah, we miss you too, buddy. Yeah, we miss you. And, uh, of course, uh, Sharon and Mark were out here from Georgia as well. They flew back earlier. I hope they're out there uh, watching on the show or catching one of the replays. We enjoyed having you here at Rolla J Studios and bringing you here to what we call the Under Green Railroad. Not the Underground Railroad. The Under Green Railroad. That's right. We take people from all over the United States. We bring them here to Oregon. We show them a little taste of what something close to marijuana freedom smells like. And then we send them on back to their states recharged as activists to make the change that will benefit us all. So thanks for being a part of this. We're glad you could be here on our show. Make sure that you help us out. Uh, you can send your uh, donations of sponsorship to uh, 42420 on your t uh, text messaging. Just text Russ to 42420 if you'd like to help the show out. Or go to RadicalRuss.com and look for the Donate tab, and you can help us out uh, with our bills and our expenditures. we got so much stuff to cover. Uh, election time is coming up in November. I have uh, already contacted the campaigns for the Oregon, Washington, and Colorado legalization. We are going to be at their headquarters streaming live on election night. We need to raise some money to make sure we can make that happen. So please help us out as best you can. Uh, also, we've got significant events coming up here in just a couple of weeks. In two weeks, we've got the Portland Hemp Stock right here in Portland, Oregon. Now, that won't cost us much because it's right here in Portland, Oregon, so we don't need to get a hotel or anything. Then uh, Seattle uh, High Times Medical Cannabis Cup is coming up uh, the week after. We've got friends up there that'll let us crash, and we've already got a booth from High Times, so we won't need much expenditure-wise for that. But this election coming up, we got to fly people to Denver. we got to drive people and put them up in Seattle. We're going to need your help, so help us out if you can. Now, coming up on to Today's show, uh, show number 49, all sorts of great guests. Uh, first of all, we've got Students for Sensible Drug Policy. We've got a new segment that we're calling Students Change the World. And joining us from SSDP at the University of Connecticut, the president of that chapter, will Frank Servo will be joining us. And we'll talk to him about what's affecting students on the East Coast with regards to drug policy. Then a radical rant at the end of the show. Uh, Huffington Post is having their shadow convention where they're discussing the topics that the Democrats and the Republicans won't touch. That includes the war on drugs. And so, like a 
groundhog, Kevin Sabet has poked his head up out of the ground and uh, saw his shadow and predicted six more decades of drug war. So I'm going to get to debunking that at the end of the show. For our daily toker tune today, Electric Tuesday, I got some great auto-tune music from Melody Sheep, the one who does our Symphony of Science songs. Some great stuff from Bruce Lee. Be water, my friend. I'm really looking forward to that. But before we get to all of that, right after this first break, we're going to bring you the cannabis headlines, all sorts of interesting headlines today. So stick around for the news. I'm Radical Russ. This is the Russ Belleville Show. We'll be right back. Bellville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRust.com. Support the Russ Bellville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Bellville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. I smell pot coming from over here and grilled onions from over there. Two of my favorite smells ever. Both those onions and that pot smell really good up here, you know. Help us legalize it. Text NCC to 42420 and send 10 bucks to the National Cannabis Coalition. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, ganja sacrament, consumer cannabis. The topic of marijuana is heating up the news, and the Russ Belleville Show catches you up with today's latest headlines. Now, here's our senior news editor, Cannabis Carey, with the Daily Cannabis Chronicle. Carey is off today. I'm Radical Russ with your Daily Cannabis Chronicle. From Time Magazine, Maya Salovitz writes, Does weekly marijuana use by teens really cause a drop in IQ? A new study suggests marijuana use could have an impact on America's IQ, but how great is the effect? Heavy marijuana use is associated with cognitive decline in about 5% of teens, according to a new study, which suggests heaviest users could lose 8 IQ points. In the report, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, research conducted in New Zealand showed that teens who started smoking marijuana before age 18 and were diagnosed as being addicted to cannabis by age 38 experienced an IQ drop in early adulthood. But users who began smoking after age 18 even if they used heavily, did not show a significant decline. Lead author of the study, Madeline Meyer, a postdoctoral researcher at Duke University, said, quote, The effect of cannabis on IQ is really confined to adolescent users. Our hypothesis is that we see this IQ decline in adolescence because the adolescent brain is still developing, and if you introduce cannabis, it might interrupt these critical developmental processes, end quote. The authors followed 1,037 children born in the town of Dunedin, New Zealand in 1972 and 1973, virtually every child. They defined adolescent use as at least weekly use before turning 18. In looking at the relationship between marijuana use and IQ, they controlled for factors like years of education, schizophrenia, and use of alcohol or other drugs that might also have an effect on IQ. While education weakened the relationship, it still did not eliminate it. Researchers also had family members and friends of the participants confidentially rate them on attention and memory skills, and those who had lost IQ points showed problems in these areas. Meyer notes an eight-point decline in IQ for someone with average intelligence, an IQ score of 100, the 50th percentile, 
would move that person down to the 29th percentile. It's fairly substantial, but it does depend on where you start out, she says. Well, Maya Salovitz does a great job in this time story of reaching out to Dr. Carl Hart, who's been a guest on this show and some other uh, looking up some other expert research to show that, uh, well, look, we have kind of known this for a while, that use of cannabis by adolescents is not a good thing. And that's why we are against the use of cannabis by adolescents. That's why every serious reformer out there that talks about making marijuana legal talks about making it legal for those age 21 and over, or in some cases, 18 and over. But still, we're talking about letting adults make adult decisions. But as far as this uh, IQ decline, while there may be some pronounced IQ decline for those a few adolescents uh, that try marijuana, uh, the factors involved here still, it's very difficult to directly point to marijuana as being the factor uh, that is causing the drop in IQ. There could be other factors, such as child abuse or other trauma, Salovitz writes, that might lead people to es seek escape in heavy marijuana use. Again, it's the whole chicken and the egg phenomenon. Does the person have the declines because they started using marijuana? Or did someone experience certain declines and then use marijuana to cope with the emotional uh, trauma from it? Uh, it's very hard to sort out, but uh, it does underscore a couple of things that we would like everyone to know. Number one, for adult users and people who start in the adulthood, there is no effect on IQ or cognition. And teenagers, adolescents, shouldn't use marijuana, period. That's why we want to make it legal so we can card them. Great news coming from the National Cannabis Coalition in Springfield, Missouri. The Springfield City Council adopted a plan to reduce penalties for marijuana possession. Uh, according to NCC420.com, uh, the ordinance had been put forth uh, by members of the National Cannabis Coalition and activists from Show Me Cannabis, uh, Show Me Cannabis Reform in, in Springfield, Missouri. And this uh, initiative was first put forth before the city council who could decide to act on it or put it before the voters. Uh, the city council on August 27th last night voted to pass the ordinance instead of letting the voters have their say in November. Now, on one hand, this is certainly a major victory for those show me cannabis activists in Missouri. But on the other hand, that means our work is not done as the members of the city council have vowed to gut the measure when they will have the opportunity to alter the measure after 30 days. Springfield Cannabis Regulation, an offshoot of Show Me Cannabis, did a great job on the ground putting this measure before the city council and leading a great lobbying effort that led to its passage. Now, we will help the Springfield activists effectively lobby their city council so the measure will remain one that protects personal cannabis users from arrest and criminal penalties while allowing law enforcement resources to be better utilized fighting serious and violent crime. If the city council turns the measure into one that doesn't meet these goals, activists will continue to fight for an ordinance that effectively decriminalizes personal amounts of cannabis. And this is a, you know, this is a situation that is, we are going to see happen more and more as marijuana legalization and decriminalization and medical marijuana become more and more popular. In a lot of these states and cities where you can do an initiative petition, uh, in some cases, it's a situation where that initiative goes before the legislature or the assembly or the city council before it goes before the voters. And it's up to the city council, it's up to the elected body to decide if they want to pass it. And if they do, it doesn't go to the voters, right? Now, we had that situation in Washington with I-502, which went before the legislature. They could have just passed it on their own. They did not. They deferred to the public to vote on it. And the same thing now uh, was happening in Springfield, where they had the chance to have this initiative go before the voters. But the city council in this case, I think they made a, a, a pragmatic political decision. And that is, if they were to let it go forward, it would have passed as written. Unlike in Washington state, where the legislature might think, well, we can leave it to the people and out there in the public, it'll get voted down. In the case of Springfield, Missouri, I think they accurately surmised that the people of Springfield 
would vote for that measure as written because they don't want to criminalize. They don't want to punish people who are using small personal amounts of marijuana. So the city council takes the initiative, goes ahead and passes it on its own so it can gut and stuff this thing uh, behind closed doors and also without much fanfare in the media. Well, we're going to hold their feet to the fire. We're going to keep on them and make sure everybody knows if they try to gut and stuff this, if they try to turn this into something that it was never intended to be, we will be right there with the next initiative and the next initiative and the next. Another one from National Cannabis Coalition. Unknown medical marijuana organization endorses President Obama and the media goes crazy. An organization calling itself the United States Medical Marijuana Chamber of Commerce has issued a press release stating that it is endorsing President Barack Obama's re-election. In conjunction with the press release, the organization's president, Thomas Lawrence Leto III, held a press conference announcing the organization's endorsement. The U.S. Medical Marijuana Chamber of Commerce claims to have 10,000 members and that it supports President Obama over Mitt Romney because the president understands the limitless potential of the medical cannabis industry, but that Mitt Romney, quote, just doesn't get it. On its website, the U.S. Medical Marijuana Chamber of Commerce further claims that, quote, Research has shown that Obama's medicinal marijuana usage is a big reason in which he understands the value of federally allowing this industry to exist. Along with their claims about, quote, Obama's medicinal marijuana usage, end quote, the U.S. Medical Marijuana Chamber of Commerce publicizes its proposal to regulate and control the medical cannabis industry. The organization states that it anticipates that their proposed legislation will allow 5 million new jobs for Americans within the first year of passage. The for-profit organization goes on to claim that United States Medical Marijuana Chamber of Commerce will solve 40% of the unemployment problem in the United States. The organization's proposal calls for the United States Medical Marijuana Chamber of Commerce to exclusively control the regulation and taxation of the national medical cannabis industry. The U.S. Medical Marijuana Chamber of Commerce hopes to establish and control the licensing of patients, growers, distributors, doctors, and lawyers involved with the federal marijuana industry. Any organization's proposal to exclusively tax, regulate, and control the medical cannabis industry will likely be met with skepticism by those already operating within the industry, not to mention the fact that this organization seems to be relatively unknown within activist circles. Despite being unknown, the press release was picked up by The Hill, The Huffington Post, Politico, Politico and other sites as gospel. Steph Shearer, executive director for Americans for Safe Access, commented on the story wondering whether anyone, quote, checks sources anymore. And a story I just couldn't resist coming out of my hometown of Oregon. Steve Mays writes in The Oregonian that a night of drinking, sexting, and a well-placed bullet leads to prison for an Oregon City man. The husband of a former Oregon City police lieutenant was convicted Wednesday in a bizarre shooting incident that ended a night of drinking and sexting. It wasn't the first time the defendant, Thomas Nunes, pointed a gun at a cop. A deputy shot, shot Nunes three times during a 1995 confrontation. He lost an eye in that shootout. The... Uh, event that led to this was when Nunes and his former wife, uh, former Oregon, no, I'm sorry, Nunes and his wife, former Oregon City Police Lieutenant Lisa Nunes, went drinking on June 23rd, about three weeks after she retired from the force. The couple drank at home and at two Oregon City area bars before their late night stop at the Casey's Midway, a neighborhood watering hole where Lisa Nunes played video poker and enjoyed her 10th beer by her count of the day. Lisa Nunes spoke with a man she described as a friend who left the bar, but soon began bombarding her phone with text messages and pictures of his genitals. Lisa Nunes testified, quote, I'm 54 years old. I have a relationship with my husband that's non-existent. Flirting with a younger man was exciting. I was just sexting a guy. It was no big deal, she said, end quote. Thomas Nunes, age 61, said he was stunned when he saw a few of the messages and a photo. He left briefly, then returned, grabbed the phone, and went home. He read all the text messages and combed his wife's Facebook account, looking for proof of infidelity. I couldn't believe she was doing it right in front of my face, Nunes said. I felt betrayed. Shaken, he said he smoked marijuana and talked to his cats for about 20 minutes to calm himself and reason out a plan. 
In the wee hours of the morning, he went into the guest room where Lisa Nunez was sleeping on an air mattress. He wanted to talk to her, but she did not respond. So Nunez took the 38 caliber handgun, handgun his wife had stashed in the room and fired a shot. I intended to wake her up, Nunez said. Prosecutor Lou Burkhart said, quote, you didn't pull off the covers. You didn't flash the light on and off. You decided to shoot a gun at her. People do not try to wake someone up with a firearm. Nunez explained, it was a carefully placed shot. The bullet hit about 12 inches from Lisa Nunez's head. <laughs> Later, fearing that he would be turned in by Lisa Nunez, he went to the Oregon City Police Department to turn in his gun. But instead of telling the cops he had a gun in his car, he carried it into the police station in an ankle holster. You're a convicted felon. You had a concealed weapon strapped on your ankle and you're going to go talk to the police. The prosecutor asked. Sure. Nunez responded. The mind is boggled, said the judge as she sentenced Nunez. It's 420 back in Idaho where Russ and Carrie were born. So we have to go uh, connect with our roots. You know what I mean? Please support these sponsors who support the Russ Belleville Show. You know, I, have you I couldn't even bring that up as a stupid stoner story because guys not a stoner. They're both a couple of drinkers. But uh, if you're going to smoke some marijuana and talk to your cats, and the plan they help you come up with is shooting someone over by their head to wake them up, you need some different marijuana and some better cats. I don't like it personally, but it's time for a conversation about legalizing marijuana. It's a multi-million dollar industry in Washington state and we get no benefit. What if we regulate it? Have background checks for retailers, stiff penalties for selling to minors. We could tax it to fund schools and health care, free up police to go after violent crime instead. And we would control the money, not the gangs. Let's talk about a new approach, legalizing and regulating marijuana. You want to legalize it? Call your congressman today. 202-224-3121. It's free, it's easy, and you don't even have to give your name. Just your zip code, and they'll hook you up to your congressman. Call 202-224-3121 and tell Congress you support marijuana legalization. Liberate your mind. Liberate your mind. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Electric Tuesday, featuring the latest in electronic dance music and other cutting edge genres. You can get downloads and more information about all our daily Toker tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your daily Toker tune. All right, welcome back, everybody. 22 after the hour. And if you've been following the show for a while, you know on Electric Tuesdays, we play the latest in electronic dance music, spoken word, experimental kind of stuff, uh, sometimes poetry, sometimes even an acoustic thing now and then. Tuesday is kind of our let's experiment day. So uh, on today's show, we are going to play some more of that great auto-tune music that I like. And I mean, I generally don't like auto-tune when it's in music, but uh, when someone takes something that's not musical and uses auto-tune on it, I like it. You, you get my point? It's like when Cher is trying to sing and uses auto-tune, I don't like it. But when someone's taking Martin Luther King, who's just a speaker, and uses auto-tune on it, I like it. So I, I've been playing those things like the Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream auto-tune, and a bunch of the Symphony of Science ones uh, with you know Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson and all of those great ones. And of course, we played some Bob Ross, Happy Little Trees from PBS, and Mr. Rogers has one out now. So I'm really excited that this producer, and it goes by the name of Melody Sheep, and you can check out his uh, 
or her, I'm not sure if it's male or female, uh, check out the page on YouTube under Melody Sheep and find all these latest uh, productions. And this is the latest one. I was so happy to see it. It's Sifu Bruce Lee. Now, I, I call him Sifu Bruce Lee. Sifu is a Chinese term uh, for master, uh, is one who has mastered a, a skill. And uh, I always call him Sifu Bruce Lee because I, I took uh, Jeet Kune Do. I took uh, Bruce Lee's martial art. I trained in this uh, with Chris Kent, who was uh, in Boise, Idaho, and he was a student of one of Bruce Lee's students. So he just, you know, two, one student away from Bruce Lee himself. And in learning this martial art, what I found is that the martial arts aspect of Bruce Lee, while it's what is he is most known for in this world, is probably the littlest part of his personality and his meaning. His philosophy and his understanding uh, of the world uh, are, are very, you know, unfortunately ignored, but uh, his philosophy was very meaningful to me and many others. And a lot of that philosophy comes through in a couple of interviews that he did that are featured in this next tune. This is Be Water, My Friend, the Bruce Lee remix from Melody Sheep. I really hope you enjoy this and uh, we will uh, be right back after this uh, video. Dear Dad, how should I say this? You know how you enjoy a drink after ad. work? One moment. <laughs> well, in many ways, I'm just like you. I have a good job. I work hard. But when I get home, I prefer to relax with marijuana instead of alcohol. They're a little similar, but marijuana is actually less damaging to my health. And frankly, I don't feel like crap the next day. I hope this makes sense. But if not, let's talk. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. show features the stories of hard-working grassroots activists working for an end to prohibition in today's activist agenda 
All right, welcome back, everyone. We are excited to start this uh, this new segment. It's called "Students Change the World," and we're working with the uh, students of uh, Students for Sensible Drug Policy (SSDP.) dot org. They've been uh, a, a great activist group, uh, doing a lot of uh, really good work at the campus level, where uh, where activism really needs to happen. As we know in America, most people that are arrested for marijuana are between the ages of eighteen and thirty, and and it's, this is a, a war on young people, is what we found. Seventy uh, percent or more uh, uh, young people that are victims uh, in this war on drugs, and uh, we know also when it comes to marijuana that people between the ages of eighteen and twenty-four make up the largest cohort of people that use marijuana. Fully a third of the people eighteen to twenty-four will smoke marijuana this year, and up to one out of eight of them will smoke marijuana more than one hundred times a year. And this is from the government's own statistics, so we might have to adjust upwards, considering that many of them. Uh, Many of the people talking to the government might not want to give the most accurate information. So joining us today to talk about this, we're going to have all sorts of uh, students from all over the country and the world, because stu uh, Students for Sensible Drug Policy is a global organization. And uh, we will get them from all corners here to talk to you and tell, tell you what's happening on the campuses these days and, and what the Students for Sensible Drug Policy are doing to fix this. So joining us by telephone, by Skype, we've got Frank Servo, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, the president of UConn SS. SDP. Frank, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? Did I get the last name right? Uh, yes, Frank Servo, that's right. Uh, all right, fantastic. So uh, are, are you new with SSDP? Have you been involved with the organization for a while? Um, I am starting my fourth year with SSDP. I actually got involved right when I got to UConn. Oh, fantastic. So a senior, uh, at least in the, in the drug policy reform uh, movement. In the four years you've been there at UConn, what are some of the things you guys have done to help improve the situation for students there? Um, well, we um, we've worked on a lot of things. Um, we last semester we um, we worked really hard to change our uh, campus's um, marijuana punishment policy. So um, you know, in the past, it had been you know if you were caught with marijuana, there were all sorts of terrible punishments you could get. You'd get kicked out of housing, kicked out of school, um, really nasty fines and stuff. And um, but if you get caught with alcohol, it was just like a minor infraction and would be dealt with inside you know, uh, internally at school. And so we, um, we equalized the, the penalties for alcohol and marijuana possession on campus. So that didn't make um, the alcohol possession penalties worse. It made the marijuana possessions lighter. Yes, exactly. Okay, good. So now it's handled internally with like the Yukon, what do you got? Like campus police or something that would deal with it then? Yeah, exactly. And it really, it really came about because the year before we had uh, Connecticut passed uh, marijuana decriminalization. So we, we worked on that as well. Uh, at the state level, and we we had we helped pass the decriminalization bill, and then so what was happening was you know this, you know an RA would smell marijuana in a dorm room, and then they would call the cops, and then the cops would come and they would do a whole investigation, and you know they find a little pot and just write like a ticket, um, and so now that while that still might happen, um, they afterwards they um, they'll just be so you, you still might get a ticket. But um, it, you'll be referred to to just um, you know community standards, and you'll have so you'll have to do some some education classes and, and things like that. With uh, Connecticut recently passing its decriminalization, and I guess I guess you've been a student before and after the decrim. Uh, how have things changed there on campus? Um, well, on campus we still have a policy where the RAs are required to to, to notify police when they smell marijuana, um, but. Um, it's definitely been, um, you know, there's been less in, in the ways of students having to deal with, you know, with court and, you know, with all, all the baggage that comes along with that. It's just been, you know, um, you can, students will just have, will just receive a fine. So it's been a lot of less hassle on the student body and a lot of, um, you know, that's, it's stopped taking so many students away from their academia and, you know, they don't have to, they don't have to end up with criminal record and things like that. So it's definitely been a relief um, on the student body. Yeah. And, and so just to reiterate, though, with this decriminalization measure, it's like a half ounce for adults. 21 and over is just a ticket. But even with it being relaxed like that, uh, the, the campus, uh, the, the administrators and such uh, are, still aren't uh, still aren't very keen on you guys having uh, marijuana on campus, even if you're above 21. Right. No, no. Yeah. Then 
Yeah, so it's we're, we're it's it's we're still fighting, but we you know we made a lot of progress with the uh, with the, the penalties. You know, one we th- don't have kids getting kicked out of housing anymore for yeah. for marijuana. Possession. Oh yeah, that's fantastic. And again, we're speaking with Frank Servo, the president of uh, UConn's SSDP chapter. You can learn more about SSDP at ssdp.org. Um, Frank, I, I'm also wondering, you know, with SSDP and and working at the university level, you guys have more than just marijuana to deal with. There's uh, there's the uh, the culture of, of raves and and going to the parties with the, with ecstasy and such, and then there's binge drinking that goes on, and we can't ignore the fact that that's a drug. What are some other areas that you and UConn and SSDP have been working on? Well, we actually, um, Connecticut passed, I believe, I believe it was last year or two years ago, we, we passed the statewide Good Samaritan policy, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, SSDP had a big hand in that, and we, um, so now, you know, the, the policy states that if, you know, if you, uh, Someone you know, if you or someone you know is experiencing a drug a drug overdose, and you you know you call for an ambulance, you can't be held accountable for making the call, even if you're in possession of drugs mm-hmm. um, or you know other illicit substances. And so, what that's done is that you know it takes away the fear if someone's overdosing on a drug. You know, it could be alcohol or you know any other any other drug. It takes away the fear of arrest and right. you know and prosecution. So th- th- we've. Um, that's definitely a big step towards harm reduction um, on our campus, and uh, and you know, and we've done a lot even after the the um, you know after the state law passed. We've done a lot of work to just get the message out to students that we have this policy in the state of Connecticut, and that you can call for help because that's you know that's always a big problem with binge drinking. You know, somebody's passed out at the party, and you don't want to call the cops because then the cops cops come and there might be underage drinking at the party, but. We have the policy, and we've been, you know, working really hard to notify the student body that they should make the call. They won't be held accountable. That's that's great work that you're doing there. How about on the uh, the alcohol front? You know, we we hear, you know, every now and then there's some story that'll come up about some college student who's died as a result of an alcohol overdose. Yeah, well, that's that's exactly what the Good Samaritan policy uh, that or it's that's part of what the Good Samaritan policy is is aimed to to prevent. And so, I mean, you know, there might still be some instances where people don't go ahead and make the call or, you know, other circumstances. Um, but that's, you know, that's, we, we, we have this policy in place and we, we're trying, trying really hard to make sure everybody knows that they, that they can and they should call for help if, if need be. Yeah, I'm curious, Frank, uh, what are you studying there at UConn and do you intend to use that power uh, in the service of drug reform once you graduate? Um. Well, I study environmental science, and um, that's actually one of the one of the things that I'm looking to do this year as president of UConn SSDP is to kind of take you know I'm, I'm a very passionate environmentalist as well as a drug policy activist, and so I want to take you know the the two are very intertwined. Um, you know, we have cannabis prohibition, and we have a you know a, tons of possibilities for new sustainable solutions in in society with you know with hemp and all of its many. Oh, yeah. um, uses and properties. And so I really, that's one of the things I want to do is work to, you know, get, get information out about how, you know, what we could be doing with hemp and why we're not doing it. Um, and so as far as the, my future beyond, um, beyond school, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure where, where I'll end up, but definitely I, I, I want to use, you know, all my knowledge that I've learned, um, and, you know, all the connections that I've made in my environmental science education, to try and reform, um, you know, our hemp policies in, in America and, and in the state of Connecticut on the yeah, that's, level. That's going to be good for all of us, uh, Frank. And, you know, it's been a while. It's been, oh, my God, way too long since I've been on a college campus. I'm wondering, right. uh, among the incoming freshmen that, that come into UConn, what are some of the things they believe about drugs or drug policy that you have to debunk them of when they first come to you? Oh man. Well, um, let's see. They, there's, there's a lot of, um, I mean, I know SSDP really sometimes tends to get a bad rap as just, you know, that stoner group on campus. And so we definitely, um, we put, do a lot of work to, to eliminate that stigma and get all the freshmen, you know, to eliminate those rumors that, Oh, if you guys hear about the drug club, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're a drug policy reform organization. <laughs> and, um, I think we, we've had a lot of success in the past with, you know, getting more uh, recognition um, instead of stigmatized. Um, and, 
You know, maybe it's kind of a, maybe it's kind of a, a trick question because I know one of the benefits that you get uh, in your generation is y'all grew up with the Google. Google, man, you can all look this stuff up. I, I imagine that the incoming freshman class of you know 2013 has got to be more educated than the incoming freshman class of 1983 was. That's one thing I'm really jealous about uh, uh, for you right. guys in drug reform. Uh, Frank, for, uh, for for the SSDP at UConn, do you guys have your own uh, site or contact information you'd like to get out? Um, we have um, we have a Facebook group. Um, it's that's facebook.com slash UConn SSDP, and that's where we put out a lot of information. Um, and you can get at us from uh, from SSDP National website, ssdp.org. Um, and then we also have a, a Tumblr um, where we, we post a lot of stuff that's um, – I think it's, yeah, it's tumblr.com slash, or, hang on one second. Yeah, it's uh, uconssdp.tumblr.com, and that's where we spread a lot of information as well. All right. Um, So, yeah, definitely check those pages out. All right. Give us a like on Facebook. We're looking forward to that, and uh, also I imagine you're working strongly with uh, with National SSDP on that uh, Higher Education Act where they uh, eliminate your financial aid if you're caught with weed, right? Yes, definitely, definitely, and that's that's um, you know one of the things that we were that we're really proud of with um, you know what I was mentioning before about our removal of a lot of the penalties for marijuana possession, and um, but then you know there's, at, at UConn that's just one step. We we want to see the complete elimination of that of that policy at the federal level, um, but we've taken a step in the right direction, and um, there's a lot more work to go, but uh, we're really excited. I'm excited, too, because we got great students like you and the Yukon chapter and all the chapters of SSDP, uh, you know, building new activists from the grassroots up and uh, working to make our campuses a better place for all students. Uh, thanks, Frank Servo, so much, Yukon SSDP, for joining us here on the Russ Belleville Show. We'll talk to you again sometime. All right. Thanks a lot, Russ. Talk uh, to you soon. Yeah, looking forward to it. And uh, when we come back, we're going to do a little radical ranting. Uh, all, right, all right. Thanks a lot. Huffington Post, okay. Huffington Post is going to be uh, doing their shadow conventions all this week. They're talking about what the Republicans and Democrats won't talk about. And, of course, one of those things is the war on drugs. And, you know, anytime Huffington Post, Huffington Post plus war on drugs appears, you're going to get some Dr. Kevin Sabet. And whenever he appears, you're going to get a radical rant. So we'll be right back with that after this. The voice of the marijuana nation. There is a peaceful solution called a peace revolution. And now let's take back America. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Like millions of freedom-loving Americans, I'm a marijuana smoker, and I don't think that that should be any of the government's business. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana. The next time you light up, take the time to let your elected officials know how you feel. It's time we legalize marijuana and stop treating marijuana smokers like criminals. For more information on how you can help legalize marijuana, please contact Normal at NORML.org. You want answers? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! And you have offended Shaolin Temple. You can't handle the truth! Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Radical Brand. Well, all right. So you know what the video looks like. <laughs> Welcome back. Radical Russ here with the Radical Rant and uh, just struggling to maintain things here in the Skeleton, skeleton Studio, but uh, we'll make it. Anyway, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the Huffington Post today. They're having their shadow convention, and I was a part of uh, HuffPost Live last week when they were just broaching the topic of talking about this uh, war on certain American citizens using non-pharmaceutical, non-alcoholic, tobacco-free drugs. And uh, today, they began their shadow conventions, where they're going to be talking uh, with various experts on issues that the Republicans and Democrats won't talk about, and, of course, 
foremost on that list of bipartisan ignorance and apathy would be the war on drugs. And so Dr. Kevin Sabet, uh, my one non-pot smoking friend, showed up uh, on the Huffington Post to discuss this. And, you know, it's it's almost like Punxsutawney Phil on Groundhog Day showing up to see his shadow and declare six more decades of drug war. And kind of like the movie Groundhog Day, the repetition of some of his fallacious anti-legalization arguments are getting a little repetitive and starting to sound like the opening of I Got You, Babe from Sonny and Cher. So uh, let me address some of his classics here. This is from his Huffington Post article today where he says, A balanced and nuanced approach based on evidence, common sense, and public health and safety has been shown to produce results. Balanced, nuanced results. Well, here's that balance. The Obama administration's drug war budget is still tilted two to one in favor in, of interdiction and incarceration over treatment and rehabilitation, just like it was during George W. Bush's administration. Oh, and speaking of Groundhog Day, did you ever notice how much Bush's DEA administrator looks just like Obama's DEA administrator? Hmm. Here's part of uh, Kevin's five points as to the reasoned, nuanced, balanced approach that we should take when it comes to marijuana. A, community-based prevention that focuses not only on preventing drug use among school kids, but also on changing ill-conceived local laws and ordinances that promote underage drinking, smoking, and marijuana use, so-called environmental policies. Oh, you mean like, you like how we drug test 11-year-olds to see whether they can play in the school orchestra? You mean like maintaining school policies that punish underage marijuana use worse than underage drinking, thus promoting the use of the more harmful substance? Do you mean like canceling student aid for college kids who get caught with a joint? And since pot smoking is now more prevalent among kids than tobacco smoking, and tobacco is highly addictive and available to 18-year-olds legally, why don't we have to lock up adult cigarette smokers in cages to achieve the drop in lifetime tobacco smoking from youth? Why have we not had to lock up a single tobacco smoker to achieve these results? But yet we've got to lock up adult marijuana smokers and it's not achieving those results. B from Dr. Kevin Sabet B early intervention and detection of drug use in health settings. After all, Prescription drug overdose is now the leading cause of accidental death in this country, and health professionals need to be better equipped to deal with this epidemic. I agree. And what could better help alleviate the prescription drug overdose epidemic than allowing many of those patients to treat their conditions with non-toxic medical marijuana that is incapable of producing an overdose? Surveys from Berkeley Patients Group show that medical marijuana patients are able to reduce or eliminate most of their prescription medical needs, and studies show that cannabinoids have a synergistic effect with opioids to help reduce pain with less drugs. Point C from Dr. Sabat. We need evidence-based treatment, including methadone and buprenorphine, as well as 12-step programs. All right, look, look, I'm all for helping addicts. My dad was a speed addict and an alcoholic whose life was saved by inpatient residential detox and treatment and the 12 steps of Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why I'm furious that the scarce resource of rehab ba beds is waste, wasted on 57% of the marijuana smokers who are only in rehab because they got caught with marijuana and that 37% of all marijuana smokers admitted to rehab hadn't even smoked pot in 30 days. Point D from Kevin Sabet. Recovery-based policies that don't penalize people for past drug use and instead facilitate full and productive participation in society. Hmm. Look, in the state of Florida... If you are caught with three quarters of an ounce of marijuana, you have committed a felony. You will do five years of time in prison, mandatory, where you will have no participation in society aside from working at slave wages for American corporations. You will lose your right to vote while you're in prison, while you're on parole, while you're on probation, and for at least five years after completing all of those, at which point you may begin to petition the state for your right to vote, which may or may not ever be restored to you. This situation has helped make it so almost a quarter, 
23.3% of Florida's voting age African American population cannot vote. Along with the potential loss of voting rights for life, you will be forced to check the have you been convicted of a crime checkbox on all job applications, and every background or Google search on you will alert potential employers, landlords, universities, and friends and lovers that you are a drug felon. Unsurprisingly, many people in this situation turn to selling drugs or committing crime, leading them back into the private prison profit ledgers. So, if you're going to change to these recovery-based policies that allow people to get back and be productive members of society, maybe you should start with Florida and consider whether smoking weed is heinous enough to merit lifetime second-class citizenship with no right to vote. And point E from Kevin Sabet. Smart law enforcement that combines credible threats with modest sanctions. Through drug courts, for example, offenders are offered the chance to get their record cleared if they successfully complete treatment. Through testing and sanctions programs, probation violators are given modest jail stays, modest jail stays that are swift and certain rather than uncertain, distant and severe. Such measures have yielded stellar results in localities where they've been implemented, less crime, lower rates of recidivism and substantial cost savings. Well, the panacea of drug courts is not what D Dr. Sabet wants you to think it is. It sounds good. Let's give drug users a shot at rehab instead of prison. But even after you ignore my points that I made before about, you know, all those pot smokers who don't really need to be in rehab, even if you ignore that part, drug courts often leave the addicts worse off than if they would have accepted their original prison sentence. These stats about the swift and certain jail stays, they're all padded by the fact that so many people are in rehab, don't need to be there, and don't have a problem in the first place. If you catch an occasional pot smoker, and you force him into a bunch of rehab classes, and you test his pee on a random basis with the threat of jail if he fails, he'll abstain from pot. He'll jump through all your hoops, and the minute he's free from rehab, he'll smoke a joint to celebrate it. And trust me, because I've heard this firsthand from far too many people who've done just that. So, yeah, your drug courts get the benefit of saying, hey, out of X percent of all of these addicts, Y percent of them never, re never committed another crime. They never used their drug again. They never had any problems because they were pot smokers. <laughs> that doesn't tell us a damn thing about the people on meth or heroin and how well the drug courts are helping them. Let's go back to Dr. Sabet's argument, because after pointing out his five point plan for the kinder and gentler drug war, he goes on to start to poke holes into why legalization isn't the answer that will actually work. So let's go back to Dr. Sabat writing in Huffington Post where he says, Research uniformly reveals that under legalization, the price of drugs would fall substantially, thereby increasing consumption. Any taxes gained on legal drugs would quickly be offset by the social costs resulting in this increased use. Witness how today society receives about $1 in alcohol and tobacco tax revenue for every $10 lost on the social costs of those two legal drugs. Increased drug use means increased costs, including those borne by American businesses as they deal with a high workforce, greater absenteeism, and less productivity. Oh, seriously, Kevin, this whole, the legal drugs are awful. Uh, that's not even fooling the squares anymore. Because we all understand that alcohol and tobacco are toxic and addictive. Say it with me, kids. Alcohol and tobacco are toxic and addictive. The social costs from tobacco owe to huge health care costs for lung cancer and other diseases. The social costs for alcohol owe to health care costs from alcoholism, as well as the social mayhem costs from drunk driving, drunk assaults, and murders. However... A Canadian study recently conducted showed that the social per-user costs of alcohol were eight times greater and tobacco were 40 times greater than the cost of a cannabis consumer. Where a smoker cost Canada about 800 bucks and a drinker cost Canada about 165 bucks, a toker cost 20 bucks. So whatever the tokers cost America, 
We're bearing that cost now, and we have absolutely no tax revenues to offset it. And we're spending billions in a futile attempt to try to stop it. Now, bringing in some tax revenue, combined with savings and law enforcement and court and prison expenditures, could reap billions and more than offset any trivial social costs from marijuana use. The fact that tobacco and alcohol cost so much is not reason to deny legalizing marijuana. Let's continue with his shooting down of legalization where he says, furthermore, there's no guarantee that drug legalization would significantly diminish the underground market. In a legal market where drugs are taxed, the well-established illegal drug trade has every incentive to remain. The drug trade is so profitable that even undercutting the legal taxed market price would leave cartels with a handsome profit. Drug legalization would also do nothing to loosen the cartel's grip on other illegal trades such as human trafficking, kidnapping, extortion, and piracy. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so drug cartels make money on human trafficking, kidnapping, extortion, and piracy. So let's continue to allow them to dominate the marijuana market as well. Those are the guys that ought to be running the marijuana market. The guys that dip bodies in acid, the guys that behead people and hang their headless bodies with taunting posters over the overpasses for the morning commute. Those are the guys that ought to be given the marijuana business, not law abiding American businessmen and farmers. Let's let the Mexican killers do it. That's what that position is telling us. Let's just let the, the situation we have now continue where 50,000 Mexicans have died, where every kid in every high school can get marijuana if he wants to. That's the situation Dr. Sabet is talking about continuing. Now, I don't care how much or how little it may affect some cartel's business model, but I just cannot understand why are we are giving torturing, kidnapping, Mexican extortionist, pirate terrorist organizations any profit from marijuana. Where drugs are taxed and regulated, yes, there is a gray market for those who will undercut the tax regulations. We see it in Manhattan, where profiteers will transport van loads of low-taxed North Carolina cigarettes to sell on the street corners. We see it in Canada, where Americans cross the border to get cheaper prescription drugs. In my state of Oregon, many Washingtonians cross into Portland to shop with no sales tax. But the reason marijuana cartels are in power is because they can take the risk and exercise the brutality necessary to prosper in a prohibition market. When pot is legal to grow for personal use and sold with reasonable taxation, Mexican cartels are forced to play by the same business rules as American entrepreneurs, and the Mexicans can't win in that environment. After all, when was the last time you saw any Mexican terrorist organization dealing Dos Equis or Jose Cuervo on the street corners? Let's continue with Kevin Sabet's shoot down here, as it is. What about the criminal justice costs? Wouldn't legalization at least decrease these? Surprisingly, legal drugs, especially alcohol, cause more arrests every year than illegal ones. Legal drugs are more available and therefore more abused. Driving while intoxicated, public drunkenness, and liquor law violations result in over 2.5 million arrests every year. That isn't to say that current drug policies are not costly to the criminal justice system. They are. But that is precisely why we need smarter enforcement policies, not legalization, which would likely compound current costs. Well, once again, alcohol is a toxic and addictive drug which causes in its users insanity, criminality, and death. Of course there are more liquor law violations leading to arrest because we arrest kids that try to use fake IDs. We arrest store clerks who sell to minors. We arrest bars that don't card and people who are drinking where they shouldn't be. Oh, and because alcohol is the most popular drug in the country with about three quarters of all high school seniors trying it at least once, there's bound to be more arrests for it. If marijuana legalization leads to another 850,000 arrests a year and therefore no cost savings, 
at least those arrests would be for people violating the law regarding supplying to minors, driving under the influence, or behaving in a criminal way that affects others, not merely possessing or growing marijuana. I know. Look, if Dr. Sibet's reasoning makes your head hurt, try working through it backwards. He says legalization of marijuana would increase use and abuse of marijuana, thereby increasing arrests for marijuana, thereby leading to more social costs for marijuana. So then, if we return to a strict new alcohol prohibition where anyone caught with a beer can be arrested and jailed, fewer people would abuse alcohol, we'd have fewer arrests for alcohol, and we'd have lower criminal justice costs for alcohol. But it doesn't work, does it? We tried that, 1920 to 1933, and we discovered it does not work. While, in fact, it did reduce some of the harms from alcohol. We saw less liver cirrhosis, for example. The price was not worth it in the streets of Chicago and the bodies piling up. Look, if none of these arguments work for you, just whenever Dr. Kevin Sabet finishes a paragraph, just append one of these three taglines as appropriate. And that's why the government needs to lock me up in a cage for smoking a joint on my back porch. And that's why we need to make alcohol and tobacco schedule one drugs. And since alcohol and tobacco are so toxic and addictive, that's why we need to ban non-toxic low side effect marijuana. That should deflate any of Kevin Sabet's balloons. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. For everyone here at the National Cannabis Coalition and National Cannabis Radio, I'm Radical Russ. Stay tuned for Hour 2. We're going to talk about Representative Todd Legitimate Rape Aiken and more. More news. Take care of each other, tokers. it goes down school.